So we're going to a workshops. What the heck? Wouldn't let me put my own link in there. That's weird. So anyway, we're listening. Uh, can listen in a multitask. Yeah, that's what it's kind of about. And of course, if anyone's able to jump in, they're welcome. Uh, we're doing the two A workshop here. We're trying to do these every Tuesday, every Saturday. People that are doing uh, Second Amendment projects or gun related things that need some uh, help or some expertise, I have expertise to offer. Be great if we had a conversation happening weekly to allow people to uh, get immediate questions and answers using the multimedia formats we have here online. Of course, being archived as uh, I don't know, uh, primers and workshops and things for people to learn from in the future too. So, uh, because there's nobody in here, I'm just going to play uh, Gun Freedom Radio, which is a podcast from. Uh, uh, Phoenix, well, just outside of Phoenix, and uh, they are on episode 138, and you'll hear about who they are during the show here, and they said it was okay to listen to their shows while I'm doing some of this stuff, so I'll put the link in the uh, description, we'll put the link out there, try to put the link out there on uh, YouTube if it'll take it, we'll definitely have it on the gun channel side, and then we'll have it in the description of the video wherever you're listening to this. So if you don't hear it well, you can listen to it straight from the gunfreedomradio.com website. And Jim is over here. So you're on both sides. Thanks. Again, if you want to jump in, you feel free, but I know you're at work, so just can listen to this podcast, I guess. In the background, I'm going to be working on uh, some stuff over on the uh, Minuteman University website and putting in some, I don't know, i got a list of tasks to do here. So I keep myself busy while we're uh, waiting for people to join in or not, and we'll uh, listen to the radio show or the podcast here. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. If you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Welcome to episode number 138 of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearms.com, your nationwide hometown gun shop. Well, we are excited today. We're going to be doing something a little bit different, but I guess I should introduce myself first. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Dodd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Dan. <laughs> I think that's who I am, right? I, I'm not sure. Who am I today, Cheryl? Well, um, yeah, you could be Dan. Okay, I'm Dan. Hi, everyone. I just, I'm just never sure why you're the other guy. That's the part that puzzles me. Because uh, no, no. <laughs> I'm not the other girl. <laughs> this is true. That's true. Well, today, what is our theme today, Dan? Our theme is the kind rewind version one. So what could that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> so this is going to be a best of show and a compilation of some of our favorite moments from over the past three years. You might even hear us refer to our show by its former name. What was that, Dan? Uh, I can't remember. It's hmm. on your sheet. <laughs> I can't remember. Was it? And it's not even a hard word. <laughs> what, what was our... He doesn't sheet. see it on his sheet. Gun Talk AZ. Oh, that's right. Gun Talk AZ. <laughs> we were Gun Talk AZ for uh, 
my gosh, like five episodes, if, if even that long. And then... Uh, what Tom, happened? Why did we change that? Well, Tom Gresham, bless oh, his heart, cool. he was such a gentleman about it. He gave me a call on my cell phone. Could have written me, you know, some kind of fancy lawyer letter or something, but he didn't. And he said, hey, um, psst, you know, the, <clears throat> the name of your show kind of, you know, sounds a little bit too much like my show. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. It's just such a great name, I guess. Uh, and so that was a just a little bit of trivia, a little bit of tidbit there. And so um, we scrambled over the course of a weekend, I think it was, you know, searching for all the available URLs and, you know, everything that, that could and couldn't be possible for our name and uh, put all of our creative heads together, our PR and marketing team and Dan and I, and we threw some things against a wall and what came out but Gun Freedom Radio. What Cheryl's not telling you is that we tried to get Tom to change the name of his show, <laughs> but that didn't work. Oh, well, what are you going to do? He did beat us to it. So anyway, so today's show... Uh, and we're calling it version yeah. one because we have so many great interviews that we've done that deserve a, a second listen, a second look. And uh, so I, I I think we're going to be doing a few of these, maybe even through the holiday season when everybody's so busy anyway. It's hard to you know get guests uh, that have time to, to be on the show, that sort of thing. So we're going to call it version one. And it's a mixed bag. Um, you're going to hear us talking maybe even about elections of past years and events from past years. Um, so just keep that in mind as, as you're listening. And, you know, if we're talking about the presidential election. We're talking about that last one, that crazy one between uh, Hillary Clinton and who's the guy that won? What's his name? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know his name. You don't know the name of our... I just know who lost. <laughs> oh, don't be like that. Don't be snarky. So, just a little bit. Just a little bit. So, Dan, in our Be Kind Rewind, what segments did we pick out uh, for our version one? Well, our first hour segment, we have Ken Blanchard. He was one of our very first guests. He was our very first guest. Yes. And Ken is a pastor, Marine, speaker has multiple podcasts, and is author of Black Man with a Gun. He helped fill in some of the history of gun control and the culture impact these restrictive laws in the African-American community have had. Mm -hmm. From our very first episode, EP1 debut show. Absolutely. I was so honored that he said yes. Like, I was just... Yeah, was why just did you do that? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. You must have paid him or something. I, you know, he's just a super kind he is, man. He is really nice. And when I, this this I have to tell, when I met him in person uh, shortly after that at the SHOT Show in Vegas, uh, I went up to him and I'm like, you will not even remember who I am. And he goes, yes, I do, Cheryl Todd. I was like, oh my goodness, well, thank you for remembering me. And, and I said, you know, when you said yes to me, I had not even had a show yet. You were my first guest on my first show. What on earth made you trust me with your, you know, your story and your voice? And I love this. He said, well, spirit recognizes spirit. And uh, That's awesome. I don't know, it just blew me away. He's a great man. I just really appreciate it. Well, then we have John Adeen. He's a patriotic orthopedic surgeon at San Antonio, Texas, and is active in seeking the right to carry for qualified hospital staff. At Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership, he oversees membership development. John was our seventh. John was in our seventh episode titled "Gun-Free Zones Are Dangerous Places." Why are they inviting targets from terrorists and bad guys? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, as we sit here in the studio now, pre-pre-recording this and talking about something from one of our very early episodes. There was just recently uh, a shooting in a Mercy Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. And as, you know, the news was breaking all over the TV, I, all I could do was think about John and the work he's trying to do. And that he, if they weren't, you know, blinded, the, the, the powers that be, if they weren't blinded by this notion that gun-free zone signs are actually going to magically 
cause you know bad guys to not enter with their firearms um you know that lives might have been saved that day right so who else uh, what other segments do we have coming up from our episode five titled who needs a gun we talked with carrie lightfoot who is a founder and owner of the well-armed woman llc a nonprofit organization with 230 chapters in 50 states she has recently been named in newsbacks as one of 2015's 100 most influential in pro-gun rights mm. and so that intro was from 2015 and so she had 230 chapters and she probably and got like a million now, I don't know. <laughs> it's true she is such a go-getter um and yes she had been recently named as uh 100 most influential and i mean this was on year three i think for her of, of even having her business to have that kind of exponential growth uh, just incredible it shows you that she was the right person at the right time to fill uh, a hunger out there um that women were wanting to be trained and and empowered and feel protected and we saw her about a week or two ago mm -hmm. i don't think she slowed down at all no because now she's even on the board of directors of the nra so that's going to get some more membership <laughs> i'm She'll telling you going. it's that's true great. it's true well our second hour segment from episode 13 from 2015 titled can you hear me now we dedicated the entire hour to the cast of the polite society podcast co-host Paul Lathrop, Rob Morris, Gary Daughtry, and John Richardson talk about the Hearing Protection Act. That back in 2015 had at least a shot of getting passed, but we have gone through two full years with GOP, had the House, the Senate, and the presidency all in while the elaborate electorate who voted them in having asked, can you hear me now? That was a little hard there. But basically what we're saying is, they haven't moved on it. No. All those years, all the power we have. You know, that's we, we think about that. Okay, uh, we vote and we're going to have, it's going to be so exciting because we're going to have all these people in place and things are really going to happen. And then, boom, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Either side. Fizzle. More Either like side. Fizzle, not yes. even boom. Fizzle. And the Hearing Protection Act is about protecting your hearing organs, your ears, all the stuff going on in your ears that the, the big heavy noises of of the shooting sports and hunting and those sorts of things, you know, it, it, to me it's such a no brainer. I can't believe it's even controversial. Well, I think the reason why that is Hollywood has been too loud about the fake <laughs> stuff, and the people that are against it can't hear already. They just can't their hear. Their ears are closed. Their ears are closed. They're although they listen. Same. Their ears are closed. Oh, I like all that that you just did there. Well, I don't know. Well, we, uh, I think, without further ado, maybe we uh, we get this party started. So, this is our Be Kind Rewind, which it, it was before I think we even did the Responsibly Armed Citizen Report, and definitely before Dan's come. Um, did we even so, know that we were going to continue doing this? You know what? I mean, what were we doing? I don't know, but it's been God, fun. I've enjoyed it. I hope that the listeners enjoy taking this uh, trip into the Wayback Machine. <laughs> Which one? The <laughs> Garth one or the other one? Uh, they can pick because it's all in their imagination. One's kind of trippy and the other one's kind of real. So <laughs> I don't know. All right, stick around. We have a great Be Kind Rewind version one show on the other side of these messages. Hey ladies, Cheryl Todd here from azfirearms.com. Many of us ladies are taking the important step of becoming responsibly armed, but it can be an intimidating process. And with all the politics swirling, a first-time gun buyer, whether a guy or a lady, might feel uncertain about where to begin and who to trust. At azfirearms.com, we are a small, friendly, family-owned shop that specializes in first-time gun buyers. We are staffed with knowledgeable people who are ready to help answer all of your questions. My husband 
husband Dan and I pride ourselves on having a safe, no pressure environment. Once you have decided on a purchase, azfirearms.com partners with professional firearms instructors who will train you to become a responsible, safe, prepared, and proficient gun owner. So ladies and gents, when you are looking for personalized service and a huge selection, come to azfirearms.com in Old Town Avondale off the I-10 and Dysart Road or visit us on the web at azfirearms.com. Hey everybody, this is Joey Rocket Shoes Dylan, world champion gunslinger and Hollywood gun coach. In the Western, there's always a good guy and a bad guy and sometimes the ugly guy. And I always root for the good guy, which is why I'm here to tell you about the good folks over at azfirearms.com. They are straight shooters and always give you the best deal in town. azfirearms.com is the biggest little gun shop in Arizona and have something for every single gun enthusiast. Long guns, pistols, hunting, military, law enforcement, home protection, you name it. And when you've got some guns to sell or trade in and trade up, azfirearms.com are the folks to see. Geez, they bought a cannon once. They are family owned and operated, friendly staff, courteous, totally reliable. azfirearms.com will give you the best value for your used guns. So stop in, see my friends Dan and Cheryl Todd at azfirearms.com in Old Town Avondale off the I-10 and Dysart Road and tell them Joey Rocket Shoes Dylan sent you. Welcome back to Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearms.com, your nationwide hometown gun shop. And I am being full on mocked by our studio producer, Ed, and my co-host, the other guy, Dan Todd, right now. As what did I do? <laughs> did you do that? Oh, Ed and I are sitting here talking about something, and you, Cheryl just like over in a corner over there. You were lip syncing my intro. What did you yourself? <laughs> All right. Well, we do enjoy having fun at my expense, clearly, but uh, we are uh, enjoying a best of show today. This is our Be Kind Rewind version one. And in our first segment, we're going to go back to episode number one, our debut show. And our very first show, our very first guest was Ken Blanchard. Ken is a pastor, Marine speaker, has multiple podcasts, and is the author of Black... Oops. C-SPAN clip, do you buy a for debut show? And our very first show, our very first guest, was Ken Blanchard. Ken is a pastor, Marine speaker, has multiple podcasts, and is the author of Black Man with a Gun. He helped fill in some of the history of gun control and the cultural impact these restrictive laws have had in the African American community. Listen now. So what are all these people doing on YouTube? This is a two-way media workshop. Uh, if you want to get in here and chat about two-way projects, then there's links to gun channels, or you know, gun channels is where we're at. And there's links out there you can join. I'm listening to the podcast here because no one's jumping in. Everybody's having a big uh, Yahoo event over in the chats over here. So uh, if anybody's got anything they want to talk about with uh, two-way projects, otherwise I guess I'll go back to this podcast. Well, let me give a setup here. I am super excited to talk to Ken, but I want to introduce folks to um, to Ken. You, you said a little bit at the top of the hour, man's been a Marine, a CIA agent. He's a, a reverend, clearly, um, a gun rights activist. And how I came uh, to know of him was a C-SPAN clip. And I'm going to play a little piece of that just so you can see why I was like, I got to know this man. I got to I got to talk to this man. The very first gun laws in America actually started in Virginia, when we're still colonies. And from 1640, there's been a long time history of rules against who has the guns. The very first gun law was against 
Native Americans, the African and Chinese servants. It's gone every 30 years since then. And in the 1800s, especially after the Civil War, it was the institution of the black codes. Once you find out who has the guns, you can take the guns. And it was instituted as almost um, a, a habitual thing for the African community that you don't want to keep your son or daughter out of work camp, out of jail, out from beginning to lynch. Because, see, the rules were so heinous that if you had even a musket ball or even a dog in your property, you could be pulled out by anybody, any citizen. So the rules continued that way so bad that grandmothers and mothers would say, I don't want my boys playing with guns. It wasn't because of the Second Amendment. It wasn't because of the right to keep them bare. It was just to keep them alive. When you had everything going against you, and when we moved, we migrated from the rural south into the cities, it got even worse because we had we lost space. We were crammed together. All the laws were put exactly where the black people were. So Chicago and Detroit, the same place where we migrated from, also became the strictest places because they wanted to keep us in check, keep us in line, and that has been a steady stream and never stop. So when you say registration, it's a button for me. Reverend Ken Blanchard, welcome so much to the show. How are you? Doing good. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it is absolutely my honor. Now, that clip, those were some strong words. I mean, you know your history. You are passionate about gun rights. You are passionate about making sure that those are perpetuated into the next generation. Where does all that come from, Ken? It came from realizing that I was privileged and I had missed for years the fact that what I was taking for granted was not taught everywhere else. I originally just wanted to be another firearms instructor. I wanted to be the guy that when you go buy a firearm, You'll look me up and you'll, I'll, bring, I'll come to your household and I'll make sure that all your kids know about gun safety. And I'll make sure that all people in the house, all the adults, were safe owners and responsible citizens. And my community said, get out of here with that stuff. We don't do that. And I thought, what are you talking about? You know, Guns are bad. And I was like, in whose house? And I thought, wow, I got to start from scratch. I can't even become an instructor. I have to become an evangelist first. And that is so interesting to me. And I mean, you just talk about the privilege. I, I think that goes for all of us. I think we take so many things for granted and uh, we don't understand and appreciate what other people have fought and died for and, and our rights and our privileges. And I think that the second thing you touched on, it's so heightened in the African-American community, um, all of these ideas. And to be honest with you, I feel so naive but honestly, I did not know until I was reading your book what what a cultural thing it is, firearms in the black community. So can you talk a little bit more, like educate us a little bit more about what that's where that comes from? Um, we start from just surviving. We have families upon family that are just trying to make it, um, just trying to go from poverty to success, just trying to get education trying to do better than the generation before them. And I think it was um, the Greek philosopher um, Socrates that said you can't be a philosopher if you're hungry. Mm. So, so to be, to, to argue about the rights of the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, is a bit far from you when you're just trying to not get killed mm -hmm. um, for having a, a musket ball in your house or to be caught with a rifle and not have a, a permit by the landowner or some writ that says it's okay for you. Um, so there's a there's a history that I had to overcome and I had to see it for what it was. Um, it wasn't my rule. I just had to work with what I had. And then my grandmother was my first inspiration because my grandmother had a whole bunch of kids constantly in and out of her house with a loaded shotgun behind the stove. And Wait, wait, we got to pause for a gasp. Wait, there was a loaded shotgun just leaning against a wall and a bunch of kids running around? What What are you talking about? Yeah, that, whenever whenever my family stops and goes, you still doing that black man with a gun thing? And I'm going, yeah, I am. <laughs> just a little thing. I'm doing it on the side. I know, right, no yeah. big deal. And, and they said, um, what started it? And I said, Grandma. And they go, what? They go, I go, yeah. Remember Grandma's shotgun? They go, yeah. You touch it and you can you were earned the wrath of my grandmother. Right. And we're like, right. Everybody doesn't have that. Everybody doesn't have that common sense thing. And then we listen to all the talking heads that tell us that if you have a gun in your house, that you're going to be killed by it. It's going to just blink around and just shoot 
the people. Right. So I they, put they do in, that in the dead of night, right? Right, right. So I thought, how many people has that shotgun killed that you know of? And they're like, oh, oh yeah, okay, keep on talking then. And then everybody goes back to normal. I just picked up like one point of, of my family that we just took for granted. And then when I became I'm a Marine and became a law enforcement officer and a firearms instructor, and I saw how little thing, wherever you learn, whatever you got from society, television, the movie, you carry it on to the range. And that same thing happened pro and con with firearms. So you have to do a lot of debunking of the myths. And because there was also a preacher deep inside um, the rebel, um, I had to split duties. And sometimes, I remember a couple of times in church, somebody would say, yeah, another person got killed. Those darn guns. And the deacons would flash him a look like, don't get rev started. Right. <laughs> don't even go there. That. He'll come off this pulpit and change up on you. And uh, I had to laugh. <laughs> so was like, yeah. Yeah, how do you rectify that then? Now you're a pistol packing preacher on top of everything else? Oh, I've had my, my, my lumps. Um, I pastored a church for five years in, in D.C. And they did not like my pro second amendment stand. Um, we would sit and we'd have, we'd have a good time on everything except for that. And every once in a while, I would get an international guest. Somebody would show up from France or from Holland or um, England even. And they wanted to video the minister. And everybody thought that was just really cool that our pastor is getting on the, on the news. And somebody would ask, well, what brought you here? And go, well, he's very adamant about firearms. And you just did a face that's like, oh. Mm. Yeah, that wasn't quite what they had in mind, huh? Yeah. Oh, so I didn't want to hurt them anymore or, or, or take anything away from them. So I resigned from that position. Wow. You know, it's not interesting how you have to you have to choose what, you know, what you prioritize. You can't. Why can't you have both? Man. It's just silliness to me. Yeah, it was a, it was a sad uh, event, but I also realized that there was about thirty people in, in my small congregation. Um, but I ministered to thousands on the internet, um, so I, I I didn't lose actually. I love that, and you've got a podcast, you've got a website, you've got this book that we're so excited about. I just finished reading it last night, and there's so many things I want to ask you about, and this darn clock is ticking down. Um, so, you know, could you maybe come back and talk to us again another time? Absolutely. Oh, I would be so honored. And, you know, I want to ask you, what's, you know, you've done, you've been in the Marine, you've been in the CIA, you're Reverend. What, what's next? What do, what do you got going on now? <laughs> now I actually want to try radio, traditional radio, and, uh, just keep on spreading the love. I love it. What do you mean traditional radio? Like, do you have, like, a, a station picked out? Nope, not yet. Not um, yet. I've done the podcasting thing for seven years. I've um, been in the basement <laughs> under the washer and the dryer. I love it. Um, I've gone through all those iterations, but now I just want to try to get them on any station, just a station, get a little show going, and get some momentum going with that. That's fantastic. And you've got a GoFundMe account going on, don't you? Absolutely. Well, how do we how do we help out? We'd love to help out. That would be cool. Um, it's GoFundMe.com forward slash black man with a gun. Perfect. Black Man with a Gun, that is an edgy title. Can you tell me just really quick, like, where did that come from? Sure. Um, when I first started, I was doing research like you wouldn't believe. I wanted to just you know everything about the whole gun control movement and racism and uh, why we are stuck where we are. And I found a book published in 1966, I believe, by Robert F. Williams called Negroes with Guns. And I thought, all right, this will be the updated version. Right. And I'll call it Black Man with a Gun. And then there was a... Uh, Adam 12, the old sitcom from the 60s. Yeah. When it first comes on, there's a, a radio thing that says, man with a gun. I thought, that's it. I'm going to use that. I'm going to keep on saying it until it just makes everybody just used to it and it's no longer an issue. I love that. That is fantastic. Well, again, I'm so honored that you were spot there. No, not a problem. But you are just awesome i'm so excited to talk to you i can't wait to talk to you again i can't wait to give out a couple of your autographed books and um i'm going to be uh focusing in on your website which is blackmanwithagun.com am i correct yes yes sure. and tell me about the gofundme again and then we've got to run it's gofundme.com 
forward slash black man with a gun. Help Ken Blanchard get on the radio. I love it. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Stick around. We have lots more coming up in the next segment after these messages. Rob Morse from the Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast. Each week we share stories about men and women who saved lives. Now I am asking you to be a lifesaver as well. The Second Amendment Foundation protects our rights to keep and bear arms. They defend our rights in courts from coast to coast. Today, they need our help. Please go to saf.org and join the Second Amendment Foundation. That's saf.org. When you're working hard to beat debt, you've got to think of creative ways to get your income up. Here's an idea. Sell some stuff at auction. Start with locally owned and operated potofgoldestate.com. The owners, Dan and Cheryl Todd, have over 60 years of combined experience in selling antiques, collectibles, guns, coins, and jewelry. And over their many years of business, they've earned the trust of thousands of people just like you. Whether you're saving for a rainy day emergency fund or paying down debt, let potofgoldestate.com help you get the extra cash you need. Potofgoldestate.com will purchase your items outright, or you can consign them to their twice a month online auction. Pot of Gold's nationwide online auction is a great place to get top dollar for your collectibles. They specialize in everything from antiques, coins, high end collectibles, to cars, boats, guns, and more. Get started today at potofgoldestate.com or visit them off I 10 and Dysart Road in Historic Avondale for some live auction action. For more information, visit potofgoldestate.com. That's potofgoldestate.com. Thanks for sticking around. You are with Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearms.com, your nationwide hometown gun shop. Look at the person that thumbed this down hates themselves because they hate guns. Please go to our website, gunfreedomradio.com. Click the On Demand tab and Binge, listen to your heart's content. See, I think babies Every should be bathed. I don't think they're old enough to stand up in a shower. It's dangerous, really. So I don't understand that whole concept of that tradition. It seems dangerous to babies. On the guest tab. There are photos and bios and links to all of the guests that we've ever had on the show. It is a wonderful resource, and uh, we don't hate it when you spend time there. All right, so this is our Be Kind Rewind version one show. And now, stepping into the Wayback Machine, we're going to go to episode number seven. Dan, is this back when we used to use the, was it two cans and a string? Well, yeah, but we didn't really use a string. Kind of... Mail ladies going by. Here's our sales. Zero. Eight people looked at the store today. Nothing's to going out in the store, I guess. Only Christmas. It's no big deal. We need some money at Christmas. I don't know. And the cans were kind of like used cans with beans in them. And really sloppy. Yeah, that was the time. That's awesome. There's a visual for you. So way back, episode seven, we talked with Dr. John Dean. Now, Dr. Dean is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon in San Antonio, Texas. He was active in seeking the right to carry for qualified hospital staff. At Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership, the DRGO, he oversees membership development. So John was in our seventh episode, which was titled, Gun Free Zones Are Dangerous Places. Why? They are inviting targets for terrorists. Thanks. And Appreciate guys. picking up We're so glad store. that you stuck around through the break got a very interesting guest coming up. You know, we have a lot of voices out there, thankfully, that are saying things like uh, guns in responsible hands save lives. It reduces Screw injuries you, you and it protects property by preventing violent crime. We hear that, but we don't often hear that from doctors. And I want to welcome to the show, Dr. John Adine. Hello, are you there? I'm here. 
Very good. And please tell me, I said your name right. Did it. Got it right. Fantastic. John, uh, we were both at the um, the GRPC uh, a couple weekends ago. I didn't get a chance to meet you in person. And I, I'm so thankful that you uh, took the time today to come on the radio and talk with us. And I, I think that most people would be surprised to hear that there's such an organization, as I was surprised, as Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership. ERGO.us is the website. Where did that come from? How? Oh, I had to remember that this is an old interview because I know that Cheryl and him know each other. So I'm like, what do you mean you don't know each other? Back then they didn't know each other. How did that develop? Well, that was started by Dr. Tim Wheeler back in 1994, believe it or not. And uh, it was a project for the Claremont Institute. Uh, and Tim uh, saw what was going on and some of the junk sciences that, that, was, you know, that were being put out, and he got involved. Uh, he actually testified in front of Congress, and he was partially responsible for getting the funding of the junk science out from the uh, uh, NIH. Um, he's been on TV, a lot of TV shows. I mean, he really was the voice for a long time. Over the last year or so, there's been a revamping. And, in uh, junk science. Uh, Right? Well, no, not just that, but also in, in DRGO. Okay. Um, we have a leadership team, which includes Tim. He's still the director, but we've got some fresh blood and we've uh, got some expertise. We've got, you know, you saw them up there on the on the stage at uh, Gun Rights Policy. Um, but we're trying to uh, put some new blood into the organization and get it going again. Now, physicians are in a position to see people at their worst. Uh, if you go to any emergency room in any large city hospital, you see the results of the violence that happens. Right. The, the problem is, is that uh, a lot of the, the physicians now that are in the uh, kind of the power corridors and in the academic you know, halls don't see that. So they live in their little ivory tower, whereas the, uh, a lot of us are in the trenches. Right. And we see we see direct trauma. We go to the you see the gang violence, uh, and we know that. Uh, taking guns away from the good guys is not the solution, uh, especially gun-free zones. That's my thing. I've been fighting against gun-free zones now for the last couple of years. Well, and that's where I really wanted to kind of zero in on today because I already was so struck by the talk you gave at the GRPC about how terrorists and bad guys view a hospital, like from a tactical point of view, but then days later when we've had this horrible event in UCC uh, college shooting, and I just thought, you know, I, I need you to talk to our listeners about that very thing, gun-free zones and, and how the bad guys view those those uh, areas. Well, uh, I was fortunate last year that I was up on a panel with Masada You talked, you all talked about gun-free zones. And Masada you uh, okay. said that gun-free zones are the preferred hunting grounds for psychopathic murderers. That's true. Think about that. Yeah, these guys plan this stuff out. Uh, I actually wrote an article called The Unthinkable, an Active Shooter in the Hospital, mm -hmm. and I talked a lot about that. It, it, uh, we, you can look that uh, through Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership's website, drgo.us. Um, but basically, these guys plan this stuff out. They have... Um, you know, kind of five stages that they go through. They fantasize first, then they plan it, then they prepare it, and then they approach with whatever tools they're going to use, and then, of course, they implement their attack. Um, and some of these guys plan for years in advance. We have evidence of that. Uh, so they pick a place where they know they're not going to have resistance. These guys are essentially cowards. And as soon as there's resistance, they will either give up or commit suicide, and that's been seen over and over and over again. The problem is when you have a gun-free zone, the time it takes for a response to happen often is greater than the time that the actual incident takes to go through. We've seen that um, so many times on these big news stories, and even the little news stories when people are trying to protect their own life or their own home. So that's an excellent point. Right, and, and, and the thing is, and you, when you translate that into the hospital setting, now you're looking at a 10-story building that covers several blocks. Even if you have somebody in the emergency department, when something happens somewhere else in the hospital, it may take them minutes to get to where this is, you know, where the attack is going to happen. In the meantime, you know, the, the stopwatch of death is uh, is running, 
and people are getting uh, shot, you know, injured or killed during that time. So one of the things that I was trying to do is to get uh, the hospital to sign off on having some of our staff actually be armed. Uh, and actually, one of the things that I really wanted to do was work with the law enforcement to train together so that when we, if we ever did have an incident, they would know who the people are, but they've been training with them. So we won't have blue on blue. You know, just right. the bad guys will get shot, not the good guys. And how is um, that going? Are you being received at all? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, I did I did a, uh, a petition last summer, and I get, got almost 500 signatures from hospital employees until I got a phone call from the CEO that says, you know, we have an anti-solicitation policy, and oh, wow. we want you to stop soliciting signatures. That and that was, was it. That's that was all he said. And then I got a letter in the mail, registered letter, you know, saying that you're not supposed to do that stuff. So well, uh, that, that's how receptive they are. The problem is that sooner or later something's going to happen somewhere. And, you know, and, and, the, and the hospitals have, you know, they're corporate, and they have attorneys giving them advice. And the attorneys are going to look at the, the risk-benefit ratio and say, well, the risk of having employees carry guns is higher than the risk that we would have if we had a mass shooting in a hospital. Which, to me, doesn't make any sense at all, because when it does happen, there will be huge lawsuits. That's what I'm thinking, and not that I am ever a fan of, of that kind of you know activism or, or whatever you want to call it, but... Um, until somebody feels the pain of it directly that way, I, I think you're going to continue to be met with that kind of resistance that to me makes no sense. And that the clock is ticking here and I'm going to have to run, but some of the points you made um, on from the stage uh, over the weekend was how terrorists look at these buildings. And right. They're, 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 a, they're a basically easy to approach and get into. Uh, they're easy to hold and they have Lots of bad things in them. They have drugs. They have nuclear materials. They have um, you know, co bacterial cultures that they can use for weapons. And they have lots of very prime people, such as children and elderly and physicians and nurses. Imagine the devastation if there was an attack in your hospital and they wiped out half the medical staff. Exactly. You, live, you have a community hospital that serves, you know, a 50 square mile area that hospital is pretty much taken out of business at that point I agree. so it, it's a it's a it can be a devastating attack to a community even in the big city you know the hospital i work at has about 40 percent of the, of the market share they took that hospital out you know the other hospitals would be would, would be uh, overtaxed and uh, they, they couldn't they couldn't handle the load John, I, so, I, I agree with you. I've got to run. I've got 10 seconds to go. Thank you so much for coming on. I want to bring you back at some point. Would you come? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Hey, stick around. we got a lot more coming up. Hey, everybody. This is Joey Rocket Shoes Dylan, world champion gunslinger and Hollywood gun coach. In the Western, there's always a good guy and a bad guy and sometimes the ugly guy. And I always root for the good guy, which is why I'm here to tell you about the good folks over at azfirearms.com. They are straight shooters and always give you the best deal in town. azfirearms.com is the biggest little gun shop in Arizona and have something for every single gun enthusiast. Long guns, pistols, hunting, military, law enforcement, home protection, you name it. And when you've got some guns to sell or trade in and trade up, azfirearms.com are the folks to see. Geez, they bought a cannon once. They are family owned and operated, friendly staff, courteous, totally reliable. azfirearms.com will give you the best value for your used guns. So stop in, see my friends Dan and Cheryl Todd at azfirearms.com in Old Town Avondale off the I-10 and Dysart Road and tell them Joey Rocket Shoes Dylan sent you. When you're working hard to beat that, you've got to think of creative ways to get your income up. Here's an idea. Sell some stuff at auction. Start with locally owned and operated potofgoldestate.com. The owners, Dan and Cheryl Todd, have over 60 years of combined experience in selling antiques, collectibles, guns, coins, and jewelry. And over their many years of business, they've earned the trust of thousands of people just like you. Whether you're saving for a rainy day emergency fund or paying down debt, 
Let potofgoldestate.com help you get the extra cash you need. Potofgoldestate.com will purchase your items outright, or you can consign them to their twice a month online auction. Pot of Gold's nationwide online auction is a great place to get top dollar for your collectibles. They specialize in everything from antiques, coins, high-end collectibles, to cars, boats, guns, and more. Get started today at potofgoldestate.com or visit them off I-10 and Dysart Road in Historic Avondale for some live auction action. For more information, visit potofgoldestate.com. That's potofgoldestate.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearms.com, the biggest little gun shop in Arizona. I couldn't resist doing that one since this is our Be Kind Rewind version one show. Dan uh, always kind of cracks up when I do that one. Yeah, because you kind of like go out of your chair. <laughs> kind of biggest little gun yeah. shop. Um, we are the biggest little gun shop. Why do we say that? Because we are. But what makes us big and little? Because we're a time? really small store, but it is packed to the walls. I mean, we can't even carry accessories, too many accessories, because we got to have room for the gun. So we're about a thousand square feet physical space with 1200 guns it's exciting that's the ones you know about it's yeah mm -hmm. yeah there's always the oh the, oh tony i've had that one forever that old thing yeah mm -hmm. yeah and oh by the way i bought two cannons that's that's you that's your that yeah that we do hmm. so uh all right so we are the biggest little gun shop in arizona but we are also your Nationwide hometown gun shop. Yeah, do you know what we're doing? Well, we got the SAR show coming up on the third. Is this is this thirty December, and uh, I'm gonna buy some more guns. I I do believe that. I believe that you are. So moving right along, let's introduce our next segment. Our next segment comes from episode five, back in 2015. It was titled "Who Needs a Gun." We talked with Carrie Lightfoot, who is the founder and owner of the Well Armed Woman LLC, a nonprofit organization with 230 chapters in 50 states. And she had recently been named in Newsmax as the 2015's 100 Most Influential in the Gun Rights Movement. And in 2015, she had 230 chapters. How many do you think she's got now, Dan? Probably 497. Thousand. Thousand? <laughs> I don't I mean, know. I'm, I'm I don't guessing. Know. I'm guessing. She, is she, she can't even keep track of it. I don't think she can. The, the growth has been exponential, and she is such a go-getter. Uh, she has now even been elected to the NRA Board of Directors. So um, there is no grass grown under this lady's feet. She's going to end up being president of the NRA. She's going to she would have slowed down. She should be president of anything she wants to be. She is a, and we're just proud to know her. All right, we'll sit back, relax, and listen to this episode from Being in the Feedback Machine, episode five, titled Being Once Again. Talking about the things you're interested in firearms, ammunition, the shooting sports of all kinds. And you are going to be so glad that you tuned in uh, to this segment because we are about to introduce you to one of the 100 most influential pro-gun rights advocates, Carrie Lightfoot. She's the founder and owner of the Well-Armed Woman and the founder and chairwoman of the Well-Armed Woman Shooting Chapters, 230 of them in all 50 states. Welcome to the show, Miss Carrie Lightfoot. Well, thank you, thank you. We are so excited to have you here. Not only are you my friend, who I love, but I am also so excited about what you are doing in the world of shooting sports. It's been pretty cool. There's been a lot happening, so very exciting times for me. Well, it is, and when we have people like you out there uh, trailblazing and opening doors, 
it's powerful and incredible for women, but not just for women, because men benefit as well to have uh, female counterparts out there. Husbands or wives bond out on the, the shooting ranges. Families go out and kids are benefiting from this entire family activity. They're, they're learning responsibility and focus and so many incredible things. And I think a lot of that comes right back down to, you know, a lot of times the center of the household is mom. Mm -hmm. you know? If mom's shooting, the whole family is shooting. And so that is just good all the way around for the industry for women, for the families, and for our Second Amendment rights as well, because that's that's now a, a central piece of that family unit. So it's really very, very exciting. It is exciting. Now, you, the well-armed woman, three years ago, yeah, it was just a, a thought. It was just a, hey, I think I'm going to do this thing, right? Yeah, it was, uh, the whole thing has been pretty, pretty amazing to me um, in starting my own journey, you know, looking at firearms and, and for my own self-protection which was later in life, um, I did not grow up around guns. I grew up in New York, and so it just oh, wow. wasn't, it wasn't, it just wasn't a topic. It wasn't right. something we thought about at all. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and in, in looking for information and trying to understand, well, how does it, how would a gun fit into my world? Could I use it if I had to? Mm -hmm. You know, all of those questions that we, that we have, there weren't any resources that spoke to me as a woman. Mm. Um, there's lots of resources out there doing a great job of meeting the needs of male shooters, right. but there wasn't anything that, that spoke to me, and it, it was, um, I, I found a lot of the over-sexualized side of the firearms industry, which it's just there, it'll be there forever, um, but that didn't speak to me personally. Right. You, you mean I can <clears throat> shoot an AR-15 and not be in a bikini? <laughs> you can. Really? You can do it. I, I yeah. didn't know that. That's good to know. <laughs> I've never seen that. Yeah. <laughs> no, sadly, that is how it, it, women were portrayed in the shooting sports for Ever. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, I, 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 I hate to think that, I mean, it was not, it just was part of the natural world of men and, and guns. And like I said, it's, it's going to be there. So it's not my mission to, I'm not tackling that side of it. Right. Um, but you're but, just opening new doors. Exactly. And if I want to wear a bikini, I hey, can. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. There's, so. nothing, there's nothing prettier than a beautiful woman in a gun. So, right. so, so don't, I don't want to get misunderstood, but that does not meet the needs of the average smart, intelligent woman who is just <clears throat> excuse me, trying to get answers and, and become equipped to take care of herself. Okay, I have a question for you. Yeah. What, if, if, if you don't mind, what made you decide one day, I want to get a gun? Yeah, um, great question. Um, for me, it was a couple of things. I had things happening simultaneously in my world that, that triggered um, that, that, that whole thought of my own personal defense. One was I was involved in a abusive relationship. Um, I had been a single mom for 12 years, um, and that that was life-changing for me, that sense of being in fear. Mm -hmm. And so that ended, but I still felt the, the ghost of it, if sure. you will. And then um, my children were leaving for college. My youngest child was preparing to go to college, and it was just this moment like, well, okay, well, now I'm going to be alone. Yeah. So about 12 years, for all the time your kids were with you, mm -hmm. you had no gun? No, no, no. Didn't even really think about it. Um, and then uh, I took a job working with the homeless and helping people struggling in poverty, which took me to a tough part of town. So those three things, I was like, wait a minute, I'm now vulnerable. And which I didn't like that feeling at all, you know, being an independent person that I thought yeah, I, don't, I don't look at you and think, <laughs> oh, poor little waif, she yeah. looks so vulnerable. No, so not it, at all. it clearly was an option. I'm like, what would I do? And so obviously I started thinking, what? What are my options? There's knives, there's guns, there's different things. And um, so the gun became the option that I wanted to thoroughly investigate. Went out shooting with some friends. I was blessed to get to use, you know, shoot everything, every caliber, and loved it. Started doing research. There was nothing. There really was nothing that, that was dealing with my issues and spoke to me respectfully. So the idea was born that day coming home from the range. Wow. Was that we needed something. So the, did you buy, the first time you bought a gun, did you go into a gun shop by yourself and buy that I gun? did, but to <clears throat> yeah, be honest, when I went shooting, my first gun that I, the gun that I loved the most was a Kimber 45 oh. 1911, and I loved it, and I really did know better. I hadn't done my research yet. That was my first gun. Now, I loved it. That's my first. Everybody remembers their first, right? It's, it's a beautiful gun. It shoots beautifully, but it wasn't a practical gun for me to conceal carry. Right. I, <laughs> that thing weighed more than I did loaded, so, um, but... Um, I did go into the store, but I had friends with me, so I had a very good first experience. You know, it's funny because when I go into a gun shop too, 
that I don't know. I don't like going in by myself. I'm yeah, afraid of it. And you are like and a I'm, gun you know, guru. And yeah. I'm afraid of it. It's just, I don't know what these people are, even the people behind the counter, or how they're going to handle right. that. So that, that's good. Well, thank you. And that's been a big, big impetus for this whole thing was to help familiarize women and, and um, translate the world of guns okay. and, and, and to remove some of that intimidation so that they could be empowered and comfortable and educated enough to walk in and say, I have these questions, please answer them for me, instead of being perhaps misguided right. or, or sent in the wrong direction or so intimidated that they turn around and walk or ignored, which which sadly yeah. still happens, not as much, but right. I still hear about it pretty regularly where the woman will walk in and everybody pays attention to the male customers and she's just standing there. The, the so. assumption is that she must be with, with somebody, right. one of those guys. So you need to go to a gun shop that has the heart of a teacher. Yeah. You know, that's the main thing. Exactly, so, like good. you guys. It's really hard. So. Yeah, thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. azfirearms.com. We, we really pride ourselves on serving, not selling. Right, that's why I love you guys so much. Um, yeah. Because that's that's the heart that we all need. Not just women, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, it's a huge decision. Education is a part of it. You can't just buy a gun. It, no. It's a package. You have to understand everything. And the gun stores have responsibility, you know, I think morally and, and whatever, to, to really invest information into their customers. And you guys do that. Well, I appreciate that. And then getting back to this, the well-armed woman, which you know, just boggles my mind that three years ago, it didn't even exist. And now, not only are you a huge presence online with all of the innovative products that you sell, and I think a lot of your products, correct me if I'm wrong, really are geared specifically to women, but but men could shop there as well. We, we actually find. have a, lot, a pretty, pretty hefty male base. I mean, the products, many of them are designed specifically for women, but you know what, guys? A good holster is a good holster. Exactly. So some of the things that women demand in their holsters, primarily because of their body, our body differences and our clothing style. That means boobs. Are, um, you know, talking really about boobs. Thin, low profile. Well, that's good for everybody. Um, so some of the innovations that we've made, some of the holsters we've designed or carry, all fit. They're all good holsters. And they just, they, they, they are proven to a woman's lifestyle and her body and her clothing like i said a good holster is a good holster we you know we don't have the well armed woman flying all over it you know we don't we don't do, do you ship you line a, copy of blind, you know blind labels right, right. <laughs> right. Do you have a place where people from the valley could go and we do it's so funny you were talking about the beginnings i started this company literally on my couch in an apartment we you know, love that we're like that and we started small it, you know, it was just it was crazy it was so crazy at the early days and anyway now we have a you know big warehouse and offices and everything's here in the air park in scottsdale what's the other it's it's not a retail establishment retail. but yeah okay. Okay. so they want to you want we want people to find you online okay. yeah i mean it's really a fulfillment center where where we where we house everything and then we operate from there i mean people are welcome to come in it's just it isn't a pretty, so you have a catalog, it isn't a pretty shop you have a website that has all your catalog. website has everything on it the so so, woman that's awesome and then you have this incredible uh, well armed woman shooting chapters, yeah. non profit, 230 chapters in how many states? We have all 50 states. All now, 50, so. woohoo! Yeah. And that just happened recently, just right? Just happened. Rhode Island was the holdout, so we have a gal getting one started over there. Oh, so we're very excited. Gosh, that's incredible. And and so I think what um, I really want to, to think about, you know, we've got all the politics swirling, we've got the, the election coming up. And uh, women are, I think I heard Carly Fiorina in the state, we are like 51%, right. right? Right. So we are the majority. We're not a special interest group. I love yeah. that she said that. Yeah, I did too. That's fantastic. And I look at your example. You are one woman who had an idea, saw a need in the marketplace, saw a personal need, you know, you could speak from your own personal um, experience. And in three years' time, which is a blink, it's like no time at all. You have grown this incredible organization that's empowering. I mean, if you've got 230 chapters, I can't even imagine how many women, how many actual people does that equate to? Oh, mm -hmm. Thousands. I mean, I think we're over 6,000. I think we're approaching 7,000 members. Um, and you know it impacts people even beyond that. It is such a beautiful program, and I had no, idea, I really had no idea how beautiful that program would be. I knew it was a good idea that women wanted to get together and shoot, which is what it is. It's their monthly meetings with an educational component and then a range component. 
but it is changing lives. It is, it is transforming women in, in, in so many ways, and it goes way beyond the gun. Mm -hmm. It's that confidence of, you know what, I can take care of myself, and I don't need to depend on somebody, and I'm going down, you know, I'm going down to fight to my mm -hmm. last breath here. Mm -hmm. And that is empowering for women, and it, it changes the way they walk through their lives. They walk through parking lots differently. They relate to people differently. Eye contact, all of those things, and it, it's. Um, and you had mentioned um, more mature women, the older women. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of women in their ladies, late eight, late eighties, like, taking their lives back and yes. really shrinking the target. Yes, that's on their backs and, and all of our backs. We all have them. Men's yeah. backs are broader. They don't, yeah. have such, they don't have such a big target. <laughs> that's true. Women, we do, and so this is really shrinking that target, and that's significant. Really, a significant in a lot of levels. Yep. Yeah. It, it is so much and then just to kind of double back on what I was saying is that so if one woman if you as one person have been able to, to touch a minimum of 6,000 lives who then touch other lives what if all 51% of right. us <clears throat> women the females in this country fully engaged whatever it was they were passionate about you know, the truth is we, we women could drive legislation women could preserve our rights and when you get women on a mission oh yeah i mean nobody watch out it happens <laughs> whatever oh, whatever task you put a woman on it happens so part of my mission is to really educate and get women on fire politically and involved not just talking about it but doing things well and speaking of which this weekend the gun rights policy conference is going on the second amendment foundation has organized this and you and I both are going to be speaking at that uh, tomorrow on Sunday. And C-SPAN is even set to catch all the action. And you're going to be talking about yeah, getting women involved politically. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I really look forward to it tomorrow. So please, you know, look look that up online. Come out. It's an important uh, event for our industry, for the shooting sports. And you're going to get to meet some wonderful people. And Carrie and I will both be there. So stop in and say hello. We also, Dan, um, we have a huge auction happening today. It started an hour ago. I think we better. Oh, my gosh. I need to get that. <laughs> we might want to head out there because in addition to AZ Firearms, we also have Pot of Gold Auction at 215 East Western Avenue in Avondale. Oh, they have guns, coins. I think there's 70 guns and nice ones, too. So gold coins, old pocket watches, even gold pocket watches. It's going to be great. And then next weekend, Carrie, you got a little thing going on. Yeah, we have our National Chapter Leaders Conference. So we have 250 women coming from all over the country. We've got Cam Edwards attending. We have Sandy Froman, former president of the NRA. Wow. we got to um, get her back on. Travis yes, Haley's so coming do. to do a training. Steve Fisher. I mean, we've got, it's going to be an amazing weekend. That's fantastic. The wellarmedwoman.com. Thank you, Carrie, so much for being our guest today. We are having you back. Will you come? Sounds good. I'm here. I love it. Thank you. Don't move a muscle. We have lots more to come. Stick around. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. If you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Welcome back. All right, so we're uh, doing the uh, two-way workshop here. No one's jumping in, so we're listening to uh, Gun Freedom Radio. It's a podcast that goes on weekly. This is last week's show, which is a flashback show. So most of these uh, interviews and snips are from years ago. It's interesting to see. They're on episode 138, so these are hundreds of episodes ago, hundreds of weeks ago, 
I guess. And uh, there's links out there on gun channels, uh, gunchannels.com slash Minuteman. Jim's been the only one hanging out with me over there. Uh, there's YouTube, of course, because we exploit their system here to have these conversations only until GunStreamer and GunTube.org are able to pick up and uh, offer this tech piece. Otherwise, I uh, would we'll go hang out on GunChannels.com and uh, have part of the conversation over there. The goal here with these 2A workshops every Tuesday, every Saturday, is to have an open workshop environment with people who understand and deal with uh, stuff, uh, whether it be cameras, whether it be software, whether it be websites, whether it be search engine optimization, whether it be coding, or whether it be networking, or whether it be the industry, or whether it be just keeping... Uh, interested in doing projects. Our goal is to encourage and enhance people to do Second Amendment projects and these workshops are designed to uh, give people time to do that, to chat about things, to ask questions, either as people watching stuff or as people creating or hopefully as people who are deciding to create. There's nobody jumping in even though there's links over here all over the place. Uh, you're making the decision not to jump in, that's fine. Go ahead and listen. I'm going to keep doing these. It's the only way to get people to jump in is to make it available. So. Um, I'm going to uh, go back to the podcast over Back here. to our number. Feel free to jump in, though. Links are out there, and we'll uh, end the podcast and keep talking about 2A stuff. But this is just filler while they work on some projects over here. Two <coughs> of episode 138 of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearms.com. Your nationwide hometown gun shop. Well, this is our Be Kind Rewind version one show. Half the people don't even know what that means. What to rewind? <laughs> what do you rewind nowadays? All right. So this is taking, this is going old school back when we used to have uh, VHS rentals. Yes, VHS rental tapes. And they would say that, be kind, rewind. If you brought your VHS tape back to the rental store, people are like, what the heck is a rental store, right? And you had not rewound it, they would generally charge you a penalty fee, right? Because then somebody there had to use man hours to stick it in the little gadget and hit the rewind button. So, uh, yeah, that's taking us back right there. Well, maybe a cassette tape, an audio cassette, cassette tape. Do those even exist <laughs> Right, or a real to real. You wanted to hear a song over? It took like a minute. You know, now you just hit a button. It's not even, they don't even call it rewind. They don't even call it replay. What do they call it? Just play it again, right? Play it again, Sam. Yeah, that's it. All right, so this is version one because I think we're going to be doing more of these. So, We Kind Rewind is a best of show and a compilation of some of our favorite moments from over the past three years. You might even hear us refer to our show by its former name, which was Dan? Gun Talk. <laughs> hey, just because it's the best of doesn't mean that everybody was the best, but we have to kind of pick two ones, right? That's true. Gun Talk AZ was our name for about six whole episodes. Yeah, before here's what you're doing to I me realized right I was kind of stealing Tom. Here's Russian's what you're doing to me. Show's name. Okay, you're doing this. Okay. We had to quit saying gun talk, AZ. So I, you know, I, every time I say something, it was gun talk when I wasn't supposed to say it. Now I got it out of my mind. You're bringing it back. So next week, guess what? <laughs> Welcome <laughs> you, to gun talk, you gotta, AZ. You got to highlight and delete that. All right. Well, today's show is a mixed bag. <coughs> it's a lot of fun. You might just talking about, you know, maybe events from past years, maybe the election that was coming up back in 2015 when we recorded this next whole segment. Um, so just, uh, you know, it would be interesting to say, to, to put yourself back then when there was so much uncertainty certainty, and we didn't know who was going to end up winning the election uh, between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Um, but interesting. So without further ado, from episode 13, from back in 2015, this show was titled, Can You Hear Me Now? We had dedicated the entire hour to the cast of the Polite Society podcast, co-host Paul Lathrop, 
John Morris, Gary Doherty, and John Richardson talking about the Hearing Protection Act that back in 2015 at least had a shot of getting passed. But we have gone through two full years now when the GOP at the House, the Senate, and the Presidency, all the while, the electorate who voted them in have been asking, can you hear us now? Listen in from our show back in 2015. Welcome back to the second hour of Gun Freedom Radio. We engage, we educate, and we inform. And we are sponsored by azfirearms.com, the biggest little gun shop in Arizona. And today we have titled our show, Can You Hear Me Now? Earlier, we were talking with a set of parents uh, who are talking about how do you safely have kids and guns together, and sometimes kids don't listen. So that's how that tied in. But this hour, we're going to talk with the hosts of the Polite Society podcast about a new bill that's being proposed by Arizona Congressman Matt Salmon. It's the H.R. 3799 Hearing Protection Act of 2015. So the Hearing Protection Act has to do with suppressors, uh, mufflers, um, whatever phrase you want to use. The movies would have us call them silencers. And uh, the NRA supports this bill. And their main reason is because suppressors can significantly reduce the chance of hearing loss. So I'm going to bring the uh, my co-host, Dan, into the, the picture. Say hello, Dan. Hi, everyone. And then also, all of the co-hosts of the Polite Society podcast, we have... Rob, Paul, Gary, and John. <laughs> Welcome, guys. <laughs> and Ringo. Absolutely. We love Ringo and all. Love Ringo. And not, quite, not quite all the co-hosts are here because Rachel alone had to teach today and she couldn't be. Oh, I'm sorry we missed her. What? Well, we what do have Rob Morris, we have Paul Lathrop, Gary Doherty, and John Richardson. And when um, we were just on your show, uh, what was that, a couple of days ago, right? Yeah, yes, ma'am. So that was fun for us. Cheryl, we're and, trying to forget that. So I know. <laughs> <laughs> they've, already, they've already wiped that, uh, what do they say, wiped the server clean? Um, from that uh, entire episode. But anyway, uh, when I asked you guys, it's like, so we want to have you on the show. You talk about everything because on the Polite Society podcast, it, you know, you talk on uh, all the different topics of firearms and politics and, and these sorts of things. And so we're like, what do you want to talk about? And really, I think it was Paul that said, I really, because I am personally affected by it, I really want to talk about the, the hearing act. So, Paul, you want to run with that first? When are you talking? Sure. Uh, and it's not just me. John also has uh, Are you trying because no one wants to join yeah. and chat about the Second Amendment? Sense. And you're uh, trying because you, you of the apathy? You hear, the right apathy about gun, gun, gun owners? This is what is I making think. a puppy cry? That's horrible the for a puppy. Hearing Protection Act, all it would do was would be eliminate crying the, the, gun owner work, apathy. the delay, which is the big thing, and the $200 fee to be able to put a safety feature on any gun you choose. Uh, the, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I read somewhere, uh, somebody had said, if suppressors were a new invention, they would actually be required equipment because they do help protect our hearing. Well, and honestly, if you were to go to Europe and do hunting, there are countries in Europe where you must use a suppressor because of the increased safety. Uh, I've been to every year I go to SHOT Show in January, and the cacophony of hundreds of, and thousands of people, well, not thousands simultaneously, there are thousands there, but simultaneously hundreds of guns are being fired at that range. And even with good uh, Howard Light hearing, hearing protection and foam knees, at the end of the day, I have a headache and my ears are ringing. Because it, I, I'm so close to so many guns being fired. And allowing suppressors, it, you can do beautiful things like hearing range commands when you're at the range. Right. And you know, by eliminating this tax stamp and the process that you go to isn't going to make it rampant on the street with people that can't legally own a gun and have them suppressed. Because every suppressor 
they're still treated as a firearm and still would have to go through a, the background check like you would on any other firearm that you bought. So we're not opening the streets to just wild, um, bad thing, right? Right. And if they were going to be, if, if, if bad guys were going to use them, they'd already be using them. They're already breaking the law by a felon using a firearm. Right. And so what's more and more law? If they were going to use them, they already would be. In my, my opinion, the suppressor, too, is like if I was going to use one for defense, I probably wouldn't use a suppressor because it makes the gun longer, plus maybe not quite as accurate. So really, for to use one to defend yourself in a big crowd or whatever. Right here in suppressor front of all these two activists, you're going to need a weapon. But for shooting, hunting, just normal sports stuff, it's great on it. Right, right, Dan, but it's not... It, it, it's, this, it's not the it's not concealable right. because of its size, but you certainly would have it on your home defense gun sure. because that you're not you're not running around the house with your ear protection on all the time. Right. So you would want it there because if you're going to have to use a, a firearm in self defense or emergency or something like that, you, you certainly would want to have it suppressed. Right. There's no sense in waking up the rest of the family, right? Hey, well, I mean, okay, wait, wait. Let's not let's not perpetuate the myth that our politicians are trying to sell to say that this is bad. Right. The suppressor doesn't make a gun silent. It doesn't make it so that nobody ever hears the shot go off. But I think uh, for the politicians that that don't understand firearms at all, it's really more like the difference between, uh, and this is a rough difference, but a difference between a jet airplane and a diesel truck they right. still totally know it's there but at the airport they're all required to wear hearing protection right. and it's the same kind of thing you hear a truck coming out of the road but you, you don't need to have hearing protection because it's so loud and that's really the difference is just reducing the sound to a, a, a level that doesn't damage your hearing no i agree right? the, the the bad the bad press we have on suppressors come from the movie industry it's, right. they're, they're saying how these things, you know, they don't make any noise at all, which is especially on a revolver, it's crazy. Uh, so I agree. It, they're, they're giving us bad press. There's nothing wrong with this pressure. I have several. I love them. I use them a lot. Um, Let's, go ahead, Ron. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I want to bring up one thing that our listeners might not be aware of. If you haven't been to a range recently, and if you haven't shot... Um, a fairly large handgun, both indoors and outdoors. You might not appreciate how tremendously loud a firearm is if you shoot it in your own home. You know, if you think the kids turning up the stereo is bad, and the thought that you're trying to protect your family in your own home, and if you do, you and those you love may well suffer permanent hearing loss from just one shot. You know, we just talked about the lady that was breastfeeding her baby when she had to use a gun to defend herself. Uh -huh. And I wonder about the baby. Is they going to have a hearing problem because of these so close range My firearms wow. in a room that's, you know, a small contained room? So, yeah. Well, um, the bill we're talking about, it's the Hearing Protection Act of 2015, and it is H.R. 3799. Congressman, Arizona Congressman. Uh, Matt Salmon has introduced it uh, just this year in October. The bill amends the Internal Revenue Code to do two things, to eliminate the $200 transfer tax on firearm silencers, even they're using the word silencer in the bill, and treat any person who acquires or possesses a firearm silencer as meeting any registration or licensing requirements of the National Firearms Act with respect to a silencer. And if you've paid the tax, after October 22nd of 2015, if this passes, you may get a, a refund. Um, so that's what we're talking about. Now, John, uh, what's your take on all of this? Well, <clears throat> I do have hearing loss. And just as an example about shooting inside, I was at a local public library when they were testing the fire alarms. I was in a stairwell. For days afterwards, my ears were ringing. And just so happened, I went to the ear, nose, and throat specialist and the audiologist for a pre-existing appointment. 
and I had even more hearing loss. Fortunately, I've gotten that back, but that was at a level that was 20 to 50 decibels lower than a firearm. Wow, that's incredible. And you know, and imag go ahead. And imagine firing, you know, as Gary was saying, firing a firearm within your house against an intruder, permanent mm -hmm. hearing loss very easily. And you can't put your head, your earplugs in when you're in a problem in your house because you need to hear. You need to know what's going on in every room. Absolutely right. Now this is back in 1934, the Firearms National Firearms Act of 1934. That's when the the suppressors, mufflers, silencers got put on this special list um, that you needed to have. Um, I'm not sure about that, Cheryl. The 1934 was for NFA items, but. I think that suppressors was added later. Is that correct? I believe suppressors were in there originally. Well, did they, did so. they even know what a suppressor was in the 30s? Yeah, yes. come on. It's <laughs> half the reason they made the NFA. No, I mean, Pyron Maxim had designed suppressors back as early as 1909 when patented them. Mm, 1925. Today we have like the uh, co host of the Polite Society podcast. We're talking about this new bill that uh, Matt Salmon, who's a congressman in Arizona, is trying to get passed. And we're going to hold uh, the Polite Society podcast over through the commercial and dig in a little bit deeper about why this is important, who needs a suppressor on their gun, uh, you know, what? why do we even care about this? But the push for it to become uh, less intrusive, less difficult to get a suppressor, comes from a desire to protect your hearing, to protect your ears, because guns have such a loud and concussive force. Um, and so we're going to dig into that a little bit more when we come back. We also have Dan's Tip of the Week coming up at the end of the second hour. So sit tight, don't move a muscle. We've got a lot more coming up. So there's actually a question over on the uh, YouTube side. We've got a question from Jim. No, Tim. Um, does anyone here use any specific software for editing videos? I've used three different softwares over the years. I started out using the uh, media software that comes with Windows. So that was years ago, and I don't know what it's called now. But whatever came free as part of Windows uh, worked fine for a long time. After a while with you, uh, you YouTube, they uh, didn't like people to use the Microsoft product for some reason. So they actually broke it, I guess you could say. They squished all the videos whenever something was produced out of a Windows format. They would squish the file, and that's why a whole bunch of our old videos got squished. The format just the formatting went weird in uh, in YouTube. So uh, at that point, I, there was nothing you could do. So I had to change to a different kind of software, and that's when I went to um, Power Director, which is inexpensive. It's the kind of stuff that comes with a video card if you buy it, or maybe you buy I don't know some kind of a thing, and it'll offer some software to get you started maybe buy a camera and it got some software to get you started or something like that uh, that's the kind of software that is and I had an old version of it that I used for years and I did most of my YouTube videos with power director I think it's made by cyberlink uh, I'm not going to recommend it it is okay and it's adequate ac uh, adequate but um, it's a little uh, frilly it's for like kids and grandmas to make just little family videos on and uh, like you know videos for school projects and stuff so it's it's a little simple and even though this it means the stuff the software is simple it's just cluttered with that stuff and there's some open source software that I actually liked better that was just the same level of tech technical uh, knowledge needed to run it but just removed all the little stamps and templates and stuff that you just don't need to make like uh you know something look like you sewed it as a quilt or something that makes it look like strawberry shortcake ripoff or smurfs or something you know just all the junk for kids and grandmas that you don't need there's some stuff out there that's less 
less uh, frilly. But now I use uh, Adobe Power Director or whatever it's called, the Adobe product, and I can't recommend it enough. The cost is the issue. It costs $30 or something a month, but um, some powerful software. And then there's some others that I haven't used that people could probably chime in on. People seem to like the Apple stuff. It seems pretty easy. Um, my issue with the Apple stuff is it all looks like it came out of an Apple. You can tell somebody who built their stuff with an Apple from three miles away. All their videos kind of all look the same. And, uh, you know, if you don't mind that, if your content is your product and not the, the production of it, then that's fine. And if you don't feel that the Apple European feel to it doesn't distract from your info, then Apple stuff can be pretty easy. Well, I know happen to know that the suppressors or silencers were patented just before the 1934 because the reason they were never sold is because pe immediately people started thinking that they would make firearms more deadly. And depending on what source you read, that was part of the reason for the 1934. Uh, it was because suppressors were being built and they said, uh-oh, people are going to start building things that make guns too scary for us. Actually, I have no idea what they thought, but uh, I know that they made them illegal before they could even make them a company. And that's why he made car mufflers, because he knew he couldn't make any money. They just put a $200 stamp on a thing that cost 5 bucks. I think suppressors were 5 bucks at the time. Yeah, they're called silencers. I like calling them suppressors because that's all they do is suppress. They only silence 22s, really, and they don't even silence them. So it's just not accurate, but yeah, they're called silencers. Big deal. Um, I guess that was the only question, so no other questions came in. I guess we can go back to it. If you want to jump over to Gun Channels, that's a community we built five years ago. It's a platform for gun people, made by gun people, so it's a platform that doesn't hate your property or your culture or your the laws you're trying to either retain or change. And uh, I guess we'll go back. I've been updating the uh, calendar over on Gun Channels. Anybody's welcome. There's a little box up here that says create new event. I'm just going in the back way and doing it a little bit different way, but um, posting in all the events that we like to have in here. Things like the uh, SHOT Show, of course, and the NRA Show are big ones that a lot of people attend. Uh, some other things like the antique gun and knife show up in Denver, or no, excuse me, this one is the one in, in Las Vegas. This is an annual event that's pretty awesome, one of the larger gun shows. I do need to put the Denver show in here. And then, uh, anyway, so I've been updating some of the events as we're listening to the podcast here, twiddling my thumbs, basically waiting for people to jump in and actually talk about Second Amendment stuff. Um, let's see, Tim, let's over to gun channels and grab Link. Term for professors. I think it's a better descriptive term. I agree. And words matter. People that, you know, casually use whatever words. People like to say weapon all the time, you know. Think about the people that are you're talking to. And if you think every firearm's a weapon, then you need to go back to school because they're not all weapons. Only in the term that anything with mass is a weapon, which I guess is technically true. But anyway, we're going to go back to the podcast. We've been listening to. Gun Freedom Radio, a podcast out of Phoenix area that comes out every week. As you can see they had, this is a flashback show, but they still had seven guests on the show. Uh, every week they do a two-hour show. It's awesome. And uh, they said it's okay for me to uh, broadcast the show, so that's what I'm going to do on these two-way workshops. I'm hoping to get James Kalita to do the same thing. He does a pretty awesome uh, podcast as well, talking exclusively to two-way uh, activists, researchers, etc. So, um that's what we're going to keep doing, and I'll keep working on projects here. And uh, if anybody wants, you can jump over to Gun Channels. This is a big-ass link right here. That's a link to join into the room I'm in here. We could talk 2A media stuff. Um, and I continue to do these on Tuesdays and Saturdays until I can't do them anymore because I run out of money. Or we change the world and get rid of the NFA, and then we'll just chat about what it used to be like, I guess.
I'm Rob Morse from the Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast. Each week we share stories about men and women who saved lives. Now I'm asking you to be a lifesaver as well. The Second Amendment Foundation protects our rights to keep and bear arms. They defend our rights in courts from coast to coast. Today, they need our help. Please go to saf.org and join the Second Amendment Foundation. That's saf.org. Straight to but the biggest little gun shop in the West, azfirearms.com, where they have everything you need to be a safe and responsible gun owner. Huge selection and a friendly and knowledgeable staff. They're a fine nationwide hometown gun shop, and they can do this too. And when you go, the whole dot com is Come in for AZ Firearms' huge gun buying event taking place now until the end of the month. From single items to entire collections, AZ Firearms pays you the highest values for your guns. Long guns, handguns, military, western, even your old brass and ammo. We buy it all. Find us online at azfirearms.com. That's azfirearms.com. Or visit us off I-10 at Dysart Road at 215 Western Avenue in historic Avondale. Don't miss the AZ Firearms huge gun buying event now through the end of the month. Check us out online at azfirearms.com or stop on by AZ Firearms, the largest small gun shop in Arizona. Hey everybody, this is Joey Rocket Shoes Dylan, world champion gunslinger and Hollywood gun coach. In the Western, there's always a good guy and a bad guy and sometimes the ugly guy. And I always root for the good guy, which is why I'm here to tell you about the good folks over at azfirearms.com. They are straight shooters and always give you the best deal in town. azfirearms.com is the biggest little gun shop in Arizona and have something for every single gun enthusiast. Long guns, pistols, hunting, military, law enforcement, home protection, you name it. And when you've got some guns to sell or trade in and trade up, azfirearms.com are the folks to see. Geez, they bought a cannon once. They are family owned and operated, friendly staff, courteous, totally reliable. azfirearms.com will give you the best value for your used guns. So stop in, see my friends Dan and Cheryl Todd at azfirearms.com in Old Town Avondale off the I-10 and Dysart Road and tell them Joey Rocket Shoes Dylan sent you. When you're working hard to beat debt, you got to think of creative ways to get your income up. Here's an idea. Sell some stuff at auction. Start with locally owned and operated potofgoldestate.com. The owners, Dan and Cheryl Todd, have over 60 years of combined experience in selling antiques, collectibles, guns, coins, and jewelry. And over their many years in business, they've earned the trust of hundreds just like you. Whether you're saving for a rainy day emergency fund or paying down debt at potofgoldestate.com, help you get the extra cash you need. Potofgoldestate.com will purchase your items outright, or you can consign them to their twice-a-month online auction. Pot of Gold's nationwide online auction is a great place to get top dollar for your collectibles. They specialize in everything from antiques, household items, to cars, boats, guns, and more at potofgoldestate.com. Or visit them off I-10 and Dysart Road in Historic Avondale for some live auction action. For more, visit potofgoldestate.com. Potofgoldestate.com. You're never too old, too wacky, too wild to pick up a book and read with a child. This is Andrew Moore, president of the Arizona Education Association. Reading to your child now can spark a lifetime of reading and learning. Students who read and are read to do better in school and in life. Every child can learn to read, and reading may be the most important thing they'll ever learn. Message from the Arizona Education Association. The following program has been pre-recorded. Welcome back to Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are sponsored by azfirearms.com, the biggest little gun shop in Arizona, and your nationwide hometown gun shop. And today we have the co-hosts of the Polite Society podcast, we're welcoming to the show Rob Morse, Paul Lathrop, Gary Doherty, and John Richardson. And we're talking about a new bill that's being proposed by an Arizona congressman, Matt Salmon. It's H.R. 3799, the Hearing Protection Act of 2015. And we, the reason we care about this, guys, is because we want to protect our ears. Is that right? Is that pretty much what it is? Pretty much it. 
we don't want to have any more hearing loss. We don't want people to lose hearing to begin with. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And so the people that say, well, just put your pro ears on, just stick those little foamy things down in your, your ear canal. What do we say to them? What do you want? People lose shooting ranges because their neighbors complain. I can't ask them to stick foamies when they're in their home miles away and they still hear the gun shots and they complain. And I can't, you know, you can't really wear foamies when you're hunting. And, and why would you say that? Because, you know, recently, you know, I own a gun store and I didn't understand that there are 37 states, right, in America, 37 states that it's already legal to hunt with a suppressor on your firearm. Why, why would you want to do that? Be polite. The same way you don't want the kid to tune up his motorcycle without the muffler on it next door to me. Um, if you don't want to disturb the neighbors if you don't have to. In fact, in many states, they regulate the size of lot where you're allowed to hunt. You know, in a townhouse, it's probably not a good idea. How many acres does it require so you won't disturb your your neighbors? That's a well, really good point. With a with, if you have a muffled firearm, you can hunt smaller plots. That's an excellent point. I hadn't even thought of that one. Um, I'd asked Dan about this not so long ago. You know, why am I sneaking up on the animal? Because clearly I'm not a hunter. And, and what'd you say about well, that, Dan? The main thing is when you're out hunting, you want to be aware of your surroundings. And if you don't, you can't hear your surroundings because you have earplugs on, you're not going to be able to hear the game. You're not going to be able to hear if there's people around, other hunters, uh, cars, traffic, that kind of thing. So. It's very important. I, I've never hunted with earplugs on, and that's why my ears ring now. But I didn't hunt with earplugs because I wanted to be aware of the surroundings. Now, Paul, you mentioned that you've got hearing loss from uh, firearm use. Is it because you fired guns without hearing protection, or were you still protected and still suffered hearing loss? A little bit of both. Uh, initially, because as I, I grew up in the in very rural South Dakota, and guns were a way of life, and went out and shot. And I, when I was young, didn't wear hearing protection. Now, I, full disclosure, there was also a lot of loud rock music and race cars that helped me lose my hearing. <laughs> but, uh, well, we appreciate your but, honesty. <laughs> but there's also, I since I have had hearing loss i i protect my hearing however uh, we went to uh, a good friend of mine and i went to go shoot a 44 magnum we were at an indoor range and had both bonies and hearing uh, and uh, my howard white hearing protection and i still walked out of there with ringing in my ears and like i said a shot you over here i'll, I'll get some, some ringing in my ears a terrible headache uh there's Firearms are loud, and anything we can't do to make them soft is less loud, and I'm all for it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a great point, Paul, because the ear is not just a little tiny hole in our head. It, it's a very complex series of channels, bones, muscles. Uh, uh, so having earplugs in uh, does not protect you from the sound pressure, even with earmuffs. It does not fully protect your your entire hearing mechanism from the sound pressure. So it, it's this is totally a safety device. This is not like I said. Uh, it's it's not something so that we can kill with silence. It, it, once again, you mentioned the movies. The movies are fantasy, and people look at that and they go, "Oh well." People could just run around and kill people with with complete silence, and it's just not the case. This is this is reducing the sound pressure, so it, it, it's it's on our whole body. I mean, hearing specifically, but it, it's protecting our whole body from that pressure. Right. And, you know, I, I wonder about the law itself. You know, right now we have the law that you have to get a sheriff's approval, you pay two hundred dollar tax, and then you wait six to nine months for your suppressor. 
And I wonder if that law really makes any sense anyway. If a customer comes in the stores and buys a suppressor and fills out the paperwork with the 4473 and we do a background check and he's approved, What's the difference? I mean, why do they need to go to a national database anyway? What purpose does that serve? How many crimes been used with suppressors? I don't think you can find it. Certainly not a legal one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's gonna it's gonna equate very close to the same amount of convenience stores that are taken down with barracks. Right. Mm -hmm. Not that there aren't many. Right. It's true. Now, when this was implemented, it was back in 1934, and it was during Prohibition, and they, they put short barrel shotguns and uh, a few other things on the same list. Machine guns. Machine guns. And they, they said, okay, a $200 tax. Well, in 1934, 200 bucks, that was very prohibitive to anybody being able to afford it, except maybe the mobsters that they were making rich by implementing prohibition in the first place. Am I right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. You're right. Um, Cheryl, before we go on, can I go, go back half a step? Absolutely. You know, we talked about uh, protecting our hearing. I think there's another reason mufflers are great. Gary is an instructor. I've instructed students. We typically don't, we like to start our students off with a smaller caliber gun. Some of us even use an, an uh, air pistol or air gun because we can get them over. We, we can teach them to shoot before they have to learn how to flinch from this explosion at the end of their hands. Hmm. And it's my teaching students with muffled firearms, not only where yours, but hopefully the entire firing line is muffled, is a much better instructing instructional environment. I love that point. Now we're going to hold you guys over through the commercial. We've, we've got a lot more to talk about this and maybe we'll pick up on that point again, um, that in training we can help keep people from flinching and being afraid of a firearm before they've even had a chance to shoot it. So we're talking with the host, the co-host of the Polite Society podcast about the Hearing Protection Act of 2015. Stick around. We've got a lot more coming up. Hi folks, I'm Don Kai. If you're looking for the biggest little gun shop in the West, look to azfirearms.com. They have 1,100 guns in stock and a knowledgeable staff to help you find just the right firearm for you. azfirearms.com is my nationwide hometown gun shop. You should make it to us too. Come in for AZ Firearms' huge gun buying event taking place now until the end of the month. From single items to entire collections, AZ Firearms pays you the highest values for your guns. Long guns, handguns, military, western, even your old brass and ammo. We buy it all. Find us online at azfirearms.com. That's azfirearms.com. Or visit us off I-10 at Dysart Road at 215 Western Avenue in historic Avondale. Don't miss the AZ Firearms huge gun buying event now through the end of the month. Check us out online at azfirearms.com. Or stop on by AZ Firearms, the largest small gun shop in Arizona. Ben is here to welcome back one of my favorite sponsors, Duxiana, and the world-renowned Duxbed. As far as I'm concerned, the greatest bed on earth. The only one I've been sleeping on for over a decade. You've heard me talk about how much I've enjoyed the Duxbed. This holiday season, treat yourself or a loved one to the ultimate gift, an ongoing, long-lasting, great night's sleep. Where you spend one-third of your life influences your well-being for the other two-thirds. Believe me. Sleeping in a duck's bed is a wonderful, life-changing experience. Visit Duxiana in Scottsdale at the Seville, northeast corner of Indian Bend Road and Scottsdale Road, and experience for yourself the amazing benefits of the duck's bed. Or call 480-991-9800, 480-991-9800, or go to Duxiana 
duxiama.com. That's D-U-X-I-A-M-A.com. It's not just a bed, it's a duck's bed. 480-991-9800. Don Collier here. Let you know that you won't get fool's gold at Potty Gold Auction. They're the genuine article. Potty Gold Auctions off guns, coins, jewelry, and antiques of every kind. Stop in and see my friends Dan and Cheryl Todd in Avondale, Arizona for some live auction action. Or check them out on the web at pottygoldestate.com. Auctions take place the first and third Tuesday of every month and are full of a great mix of antiques, collectibles, jewelry, guns, and coins. Visit our beautiful air-conditioned showroom off the I-10 at Dysart Road at 215 East Western Avenue in historic downtown Avondale. You will find a friendly and knowledgeable staff, comfortable chairs, and we even serve free birthday cake at every auction. Or bid from the comfort of your home at potofgoldestate.com. Don't miss out. Everything is going, going, gone at potofgoldestate.com. Captain Eric Lawrence was training Afghan soldiers when his truck was hit by an IED. I was on the way from Kandahar to Klaat. Uh, hit an IED that just took the truck and threw it up in the air and slammed it over. I knew at first that I, I got hurt pretty bad because I couldn't move my legs. I sat home alone for months. I didn't want that anymore. I wanted to go back to work. I was hesitant at first, you know, because I didn't work for a good year. I want to be a productive person. I don't want to be a drain on society. I want to be a positive thing in society. Maybe they even help me write my resume. Got me a job interview, I got the job. Helping veterans like Eric is what we've done for over 65 years. Paralyzed Veterans of America, paving access for veterans' employment to Operation Pay. For more information, visit pva.org. A public service message from Paralyzed Veterans of America. The following program has been pre recorded. Thank you for hanging in there with us today on this Saturday. Welcome back to Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are sponsored by azfirearms.com, the biggest little gun shop in Arizona. And today we're talking about something important to our physical well-being. We're talking about our hearing, our ears. And there's a a new bill being proposed by an Arizona Congressman, Matt Salmon, H.R. 3799, the Hearing Protection Act of 2015. And uh, they're trying to make it less difficult to uh, buy suppressors to put on our firearms. And uh, we are with the cast, the cast, (laughs) are you guys a cast? (laughs) (laughs) The co-host of the Polite Society podcast, we've got... Uh, Rob Morris, Gary Doherty, John Richardson, and Paul Lathrop. And Paul, you were going to tell us a little bit more about the bill itself and how we can help out, right? Right. Well, we pretty much discussed what's in the bill, but uh, we the, the thing is stuck in committee right now. And what really needs to happen is anybody who is not in the specific district of that congressman that proposed the bill need to get on the phone to their congressperson and encourage them to co-sponsor the bill. Now, you may hear, well, they're not on that particular committee, but you don't have to be on that committee to co-sponsor the bill. The four co-sponsors the bill has, the harder it is to keep that thing. Got a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, but the point is... Can you hear me now? There you are. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, probably the hearing loss yeah. in the gun shooting. <laughs> there you go. I would just encourage everybody, if you could, please call 202-224-3121. Again, 202-224-3121. That's the congressional office switchboard. And if you give them your zip code, no matter where in the country you are, they can connect you with your congressman's office, and you tell your congressman you want them to co-sponsor this bill to help move it out of committee. So somebody that's never done that, somebody that's never taken the step to actually call and physically speak to a congressman or congresswoman, you're, you might end up with a voicemail, right? Or you might end up with the actual person on the phone. Like, what? 
how do you phrase that? Hi, I'm calling today to what? You're probably going to end up with a staffer. Well, probably, unless you call after 5 p.m. Eastern time, you're probably not going to get voicemail. You're probably going to get a congressional staffer. And all you, what you want to do is say, I'm calling about the, the Hearing Protection Act and give them the bill number, H.R. 3799, and tell them briefly why you support the bill and that you want your congressman or congresswoman to co-sponsor the bill to help get it out of committee. All right, very good. And uh, as you were saying, it's 3799, H.R. 3799, and it's to eliminate the $200 transfer tax on firearm silencers, which really is just a prohibitive tax. It doesn't doesn't do anything to make you safer with a firearm, right? It's just a prohibitive tax that was placed well, back in the 30s. It, it, it does just a little more than that, Cheryl. There are some law enforcement officers and you need the sign off of the chief law enforcement officer in your county. Many sheriffs won't sign these forms. This bill would eliminate the sign off of the chief law enforcement officer as well. So even though it's legal in that state, there are still sheriffs that won't sign off. Mother may I. And yep. if he says no, you what you there it are some legal ramifications. You can form a corporation and form a trust to buy a suppressor. But uh, for many people, that's just an extra burden that they don't want to go through. But and they choose not to dollars. get a suppressor. Yeah, another couple hundred dollars, and they're trying to knock the trust out, too. Yeah. Trying to stop that. What's the trust? Get a trust to buy an FA gun. And what's the process for that? You have to go through an attorney to get a, a trust. And so you, you're counting on your local law enforcement person to be pro-gun right enough that he's not going to just dismiss it out of hand, right? Because it's also a cultural element because for uh, many sheriffs in Texas, in some of the larger cities, won't sign off on these items. Wow. Yeah. Who knew? Who knew? Well, we've got one more commercial break to take, and we're going to bring you all back. We are with the hosts, not the cast, the hosts of the Polite Society podcast, Rob Morse. Terry Doherty, Paul Rager, and John Richardson talking about the importance of a new bill that's being proposed uh, to go through Congress, Hearing Protection Act. And when we come back, we want to talk with John Richardson a little bit about hunting with a suppressor. So why would that be important? Stick through the break and you can find out. <laughs> So we're listening to uh, Gun Freedom Radio over here and doing a two-way workshop that no one's participating in hardly. And, uh, you know, just an effort to keep Second Amendment activism going and encourage participation in the whole thing. We're listening to Gun Freedom Radio, podcast out of Phoenix area, happens every week for two hours. Getting some projects done here while we're listening. SAF.org. Hey, ladies. Cheryl Todd here from azfirearms.com. Many of us ladies are taking the important step of becoming responsibly armed, but it can be an intimidating process. And with all the politics swirling, a first-time gun buyer, whether a guy or a lady, might feel uncertain about where to begin and who to trust. At azfirearms.com, we are a small, friendly, family-owned shop that specializes in first-time gun buyers. We are staffed with knowledgeable people who are ready to help answer all of your questions. My husband and Dan and I pride ourselves on having a safe, no-pressure environment. Once you have decided on a purchase, azfirearms.com partners with professional firearms instructors who will train you to become a responsible, safe, prepared, and proficient gun owner. So ladies and gents, when you are looking for personalized service and a huge selection, come to azfirearms.com in Old Town Avondale off the I-10 and Dysart Road or visit us on the web at azfirearms.com. 
Hey everybody, this is Joey Rocket Shoes Dylan, world champion gunslinger and Hollywood gun coach. In the Western, there's always a good guy and a bad guy, and sometimes the ugly guy. And I always root for the good guy, which is why I'm here to tell you about the good folks over at azfirearms.com. They are straight shooters and always give you the best deal in town. azfirearms.com is the biggest little gun shop in Arizona and have something for every single gun enthusiast. Long guns, pistols, hunting, military, law enforcement, home protection, you name it. And when you've got some guns to sell or trade in and trade up, azfirearms.com are the folks to see. Geez, they bought a cannon once. They are family owned and operated, friendly staff, courteous, totally reliable. azfirearms.com will give you the best value for your used guns. So stop in, see my friends Dan and Cheryl Todd at azfirearms.com in Old Town Avondale off the I-10 and Dysart Road and tell them Joey Rocket Shoes Dylan sent you. When you're working hard to beat debt, you got to think of creative ways to get your income up. Here's an idea. Sell some stuff at auction. Start with locally owned and operated potofgoldestate.com. The owners, Dan and Cheryl Todd, have over 60 years for? of combined experience in selling antiques, collectibles, guns, coins, and jewelry. And over their many years in business, they've earned the trust of hundreds just like you. Whether you're saving for a rainy day emergency fund or paying down debt, let potofgoldestate.com help you get the extra cash you need. Potofgoldestate.com will purchase your items outright, or you can consign them to their twice a month online auction. Pot of Gold's nationwide online auction is a great place to get top dollar for your collectibles. They specialize in everything from antiques, household items, to cars, boats, guns, and more at potofgoldestate.com. Or visit them off by 10 and Dysart Road in historic Avondale for some live auction action. For more, visit potofgoldestate.com. Potofgoldestate.com. <coughs> I'm a dog, and I'm kind of new to this family, but I've noticed a trend. My humans do this thing where they go around and get all my toys and hide them in this basket. But it's always the same basket, and it's always the same place. And then they act so surprised when I find them. But I'm like, hello? That's where you put it last time. Humans are the worst at hide and go see. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. Oh. The following program has been pre-recorded. You are listening to Gun Freedom Radio. Welcome back. We engage, we educate, and we inform. We are sponsored by azfirearms.com, your nationwide hometown gun shop. We are talking today with the co-hosts of the Polite Society podcast. We have Rob Moore, Scary Doherty, Paul Lathrop and John Richardson, and you know we wanted to let people know why should we care about this new bill, this new Hearing Protection Act of 2015, HR 3799, that Arizona Congressman Matt Salmon has proposed and trying to put through. And John, you were talking about using suppressors while you're hunting, but so talk to us about that. One of the things that I would like to bring up is that lots of times when we're hunting. We're hunting with dogs, whether it's waterfowling or small game hunting. We're hunting with a dog. Dogs don't have hearing protection. We love our dogs, but as they age, especially dogs that are sitting in a, a duck blind or a goose pit, they're going to go deaf early. And do we really want that for you know, man's best friend? And I would say we don't. And by having a suppressed shotgun or if we're hunting small game having a suppressed 22 rifle we can preserve their hearing just as much as preserving our own hearing that's an so. excellent point and you know i don't know that people really think about that i mean i for our store brazyfirearms.com we sell mostly firearms for personal protection we sell some firearms for hunting I am not a hunter. Dan hasn't hunted in years. And so, you know, we, we forget about these kinds of things. And so the average citizen probably, it isn't in their mind at all. And so to, to think about that is important and to bring it, bring it out is important. Dan, did you have a thought on that? No, I agree. It, it, it is. And uh, the other thing about these suppressors, um, this is something Rob brought up, uh, Rob Morris brought up uh, off the air that, you know, so we can go, we can pay the $200 transfer tax for the, the suppressor, and we can, 
you know, as, as responsible citizens, we can go and get the sheriff's letter that says we're allowed to own this thing. Um, but there are also ways that, you know, bad guys, they don't care about our laws. And so whether they get their hands on one in an illegal manner or whether they maybe fashion one, which I don't know if we want to necessarily say how you can do that on the air, but that they're not real high science, are they, Rob? No, we're not. It's not rocket scientist and a gunsmith with Dan's ability basically would put them together out of spare parts in a few minutes. It, it would almost become a um, home assembly kit, something you'd see on YouTube. You know, Which one of the really the point, if they were so good for criminals, they would be making them and using them, and right. they're not. You know, well, one they, of the, you, the, you can't conceal them particularly easily. One of the sad points about this, too, let's say you do buy a suppressor, you want to go hunting with it, and you have five or six suppressors, and then, you know, you pass away, and now the kids have to deal with it. And it's super hard to transfer a gun from one person to another. And if you're going to sell one of your suppressors, it's a $200 tax again to the next buyer. So you're talking about a four or $500 suppressor costing you $200 in tax. When you sell it, then that person has to pay a $200 tax. If somebody dies in the family, then you've got to go through the uh, process of the form fours, all that work. So it's, it's a lot of hassle, too. Gary, your point was uh, enough to, to kind of bring forth again that if these were such a, an important thing for bad guys to have, how come they don't have them? Right? Right, because we've already established that they're easy mm -hmm. to make. So it, it just doesn't mean makes sense why we're, we're worried about bad guys having them. They, they, they don't want them. If they wanted them, they would have them. I mean, they have everything else, so I don't understand the problem. I don't either, and I, I think that it's an interesting thing, and I, I'm not 100% sure where uh, <coughs> Matt Salmon got the idea to bring this forward, but I do think it's worth um, taking some time, reading it through. It's a very, very brief bill. Um, uh, Paul told us in the, the last uh, segment how we can call our Congressional Office switchboard. Do you have that number again, Paul? Certainly. I, it's 202-224-3121. Uh, and so we call that number and we say we're, we're concerned with the H.R. 3799, the Hearing Protection Act. It's a bill that amends the Internal Revenue Code. It will eliminate the $200 transfer tax on firearm silencers and um, eliminate the need for uh, a letter from a local law enforcement person. That's it. That's the whole thing. And it'll help protect our hearing out on the range. And our dogs here, and I, I think that's a really good point that was brought up, our, our pets. I mean, if Sarah McLaughlin got on the phone with that, I mean, on TV <laughs> with that, she said, they do it for your dogs, okay? No, oh, that song makes me cry every time. Well, guys, we are about to come to the end of this segment, and I appreciate you so much taking the time and coming on and talking about this important topic. And, uh, Paul, you guys do some incredible work with your podcast, the Polite Society podcast. You talk politics. You talk gun laws. You really get into some meaty issues. And I want to be sure that everybody knows how they can follow your podcast as well. So please uh, let us know how to do that. Thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for having us on. This has been a really fun. We get a few minutes to talk about each topic when we're on our show. It's been a blast to take extended time to talk about this. Uh, to reach us, really, politesocietypodcast.com. If you want to email any of us, uh, either on air at politicsandguns.com is the email address for all of us. Or if you want to talk to Rob, John, Gary, or me, just stick the first name of the person you want to talk to and then add at politicsandguns.com. We get all the emails and uh, we'd love to hear from everybody. We'd love to have you come check out our show. Well, so your, your podcast is called the Polite Society Podcast, but your email addresses are your first name, like Paul at politicsandguns.com. Did I have that right? Yes. Politics and Guns used to be the name of the show. We found we were having a lot of problems okay. getting the interviews because people didn't want to talk politics. Mm. 
Well, now that's that's what we all want to talk about, right? Because the election season. <laughs> So you went through a rebrand. We just went through a rebrand. So I, we're, we're feeling each other's uh, joy and pain, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much again. Uh, Rob, thank you. Gary, thank you. John and Paul, thank you so much from the Polite Society podcast. All right. I guess they're out. Um, that was fun. Uh, we were on their show uh, Sunday. And we were talking about the Paris uh, attacks and that sort of thing. And so to have them on our show so uh, soon thereafter was kind of fun. And this this is a topic they picked. They I said, what do you guys want to talk about? And then they said the, the Hearing Protection Act. So it's that important um, that of all the things, all the topics that they wrestle with on their show, and they also bring uh, stories about responsibly armed citizens uh, good guys with a gun, they bring them to the, the forefront on their show as well. And uh, so of all the things that, that they could have talked about, they felt like this was the thing to really bring to people's attention. So that was kind of fun. Yeah, that really hit me about the dog. I, 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 I just think about that. You see all the times people are duck hunting and well hunting and they've got the dog with them. And that poor dog that can hear so much more than we can. Can you imagine how that how loud that is to them? Horrible, and we had a, a poor one eyed and now deaf uh cocker spaniel, so um, it, it did kind of hit us maybe a little extra uh close to home. Of course, we never took her hunting with us either. No, we didn't, she's just getting old. Um, but you know, you call her and she doesn't hear, you rattle her treat bag and she doesn't hear, it's kind of sad, yeah. But anyway, we still have Dan's trip of the week. <laughs> Got to wait for that last note. I, that throws me off. Tip of the week. Again, we're not going to talk about guns, particularly, I mean, a certain kind of gun or anything, but uh, we're going to talk about kids and firearms. My tip of the week is teach your kids when they're young. Make sure they understand what a firearm is. Not what the movies are saying, but really what a gun is and what it can do. And please put them uh Send them through the Eddie Eagle program, even at two years old. Have that movie running in their house. Just get them familiar with the gun. Don't hide your guns from your kids at any age. Do not hide it. Teach them. Yeah, it kind of touches back on the topic at the top of the hour when we had uh, Denise and Scott Johnson on talking about parenting guns, kids and guns in the house at the same time. And uh, the Eddie Eagle program, What what's their little... Did he stand? You want to sing it? I, I do not want to sing it. I would like for you to. <laughs> Stop. Don't touch. Run away. Tell the ground no. So you get that little ditty going in your, your kids' heads. Uh, it'll come back to them when it's important. And better to try, better to teach them than to ignore just because maybe you don't have guns in your home or just because your guns are all locked up with the ammo in a separate place. That doesn't mean that your neighbors, their friends, uh, are, it's going to be the same situation there. Right. If you if you don't know about this program, just go watch one. Don't even take your kids. Just go watch them do you it. You can pull it up online. But to watch the kids' reaction oh, right. to the instructors oh, talking right. about this will put chills through you because it works. The kids understand. And it's something they're going to remember for the rest of their life. But put the kids through it. Absolutely. I think that's a great tip of the week. Well, we got Thanksgiving coming up very, very soon. You know, I'm trying to lose weight, Cheryl. No, not, not right now. You know, you see what we cook every year. Yeah. Right? Huge spread. Lots of people come over. It's a lot of fun. But I want to throw a challenge out there. I say do one thing different this year than you've ever done before on Thanksgiving that benefits someone else's family. Someone else in your life, there's a widow, there's a veteran, there's a shut-in, there's somebody whose life you can touch very simply, very easily. Be creative. Go on Pinterest. There's a billion fun ideas on there. Um, at Halloween, we, we say we boo each other. So I'll leave a little a little gift. Can we thank each other now? Yeah. 
leave a little package on somebody's doorstep and they don't know who it's from, do the same thing for Thanksgiving. Our address is. <laughs> I love that. And until next time, pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. All of them. All of them, Dan. Even the ones you don't like, especially the ones you don't like. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, be good to each other. You got me all flustered. Have a great week. And God bless. Our founding fathers here in this country brought about the only true revolution that has ever taken place in man's history. If all right. Well, so nobody's really jumped in or said anything. So I guess it's just another one. And uh, we'll keep doing them.